little bit of context. So I'm a freshman in college and I live in a suite with seven other guys. We all get along quite well with just some minor bumps now and then. I'm closer to one named Andy, less close to Andy's roommate Jack. I'm a tall and thin guy. Andy is bigger than me but not taller, just a broader dude. Jack is a hockey player so he's pretty ripped but shorter than both Andy and I and is usually a very relaxed guy. Jack is usually the aggregator. So last night I got home from a party and was pretty messed up and my two sweet mates had just gotten back from another party. Andy was blacked out. We danced around my room while I blasted music and then Andy and Jack left to go smoke. I began to FaceTime my girlfriend and then I hear more knocks on my door and I turn my laptop screen brightness off and shut off the sound. Andy and Jack walk in high as a kite and Andy is still blacked out. Andy begins to get a little aggressive and so I went with it pushing each other back and forth. Next thing I know, Andy's eyes just went out. He was still looking around, but you could just tell he wasn't in his mind at all. It's as if he just slipped into this odd trance. At that moment, he slammed me against the wall and had his hand around my neck. And I'm like, hey, Andy, that's enough, man. And he's not letting go. Jack sees what's up and comes over to coax him away, and Andy is not having any of it. He's just got his hand around my neck, pressing me against the wall, and has this death stare looking straight into my eyes. So at this point I start to freak out a little bit and I'm really trying to get out of the hold. Eventually Jack gets him off of me and I lunge at Andy to push him out of my room once and for all. Andy instantly puts me in this death-like chokehold where I can feel his arms getting tighter and my oxygen supply lower. At this point I'm terrified and yelling at Jack to get him off of me and yelling I can't breathe. I don't know how we got him off but we were in a bit of a scuffle trying to move Andy out the door. He's getting seriously aggressive trying to get through Jack's arms to me. I at this point jump backwards and lunge for the knife laying on my desk. I pull out the blade and yelled, Andy, get out of my room. I think something clicked in his primitive head that told him knives are not to be messed with. I'm yelling at him and Jack tells me to put the knife away. So I do and we lunge at Andy again. I've got my arms around his torso pushing him out the door and he dumps a liter of orange crush on me that was open on the mini fridge right next to us. He then slips and falls in the soda and while Jack grabs his arms, I pushed him out the door, shut it, and promptly locked it. Now Andy is banging on the door, punching the door, yelling at me. You little baby, just open the door. Now I'm not really sure why he's doing this. But like I said, he was in this creepy trance I've seen him only one other time get in. The banging continues and his body's slamming the door while yelling, I'm going to break this door down and end you. All the while he's milling about between slams just staring in my peephole. My girlfriend is still on FaceTime and is freaking out, understandably, and I'm at the door holding the knife just pressing the door shut. Andy poured more soda under the door but... That didn't really do much other than make my floor sticky. Jack eventually left and stopped trying to get him to leave. About 15 minutes of this, I decide this is enough and had my girlfriend call public safety and say there's a dispute in suite 550 and to come quickly. 10 minutes later, pub safety shows up and he instantly complies with them to back away and sits down in a chair in the common room. I was honestly so terrified and I'm glad that I had been drinking because if not, I would have been much more scared. Andy, please get some help, because I'm still a bit spooked to leave my door open. About five months ago, a friend of mine got expelled from his program because of bad marks. He was only halfway through his lease, and he didn't see a point of staying in the city since he was only here for school. He told me that if I wanted to take over his lease, as a subletter, he would only half charge me the rent which I thought was a pretty sweet deal. So naturally, although I am from this town, I thought it was time to leave for my parents place. I had already graduated and although I have been looking for a new job for a while, I still felt like I couldn't miss out on the opportunity. So I took over his lease and moved into his place. The house itself is actually pretty nice. It's three floors including the basement and it's located near the university of my town which is not a very safe area overall but I spent a lot of my university years here and never felt unsafe. The room in the basement is pretty small but cozy and the only other room down here is a girl who is currently a student and she's pretty quiet. Actually all the girls living here are pretty good roommates. 
I wasn't thrilled about living with three girls, but now I don't see why I would have thought it was an issue. They're all pretty great and a good time. I'm the only one in the house who is not a student, and also the only one who is originally from this town. The other roommates are actually all from cities that are only about an hour or two away at most, so unless there's something special going on, they all go home on weekends. My friend who got expelled also only lives two hours away, so he would always go home for the weekend as well. One thing I forgot to mention, which is pretty crucial to the story, is that the house actually has five rooms, but right when they all moved into the new place together, one of the girls had a seizure on her bed and passed away. This was pretty upsetting for everyone and the landlord told them not to worry about finding anyone else. The rent never went up or anything and the room was left vacant. According to the landlord, he just found it insensitive to try and find someone because he didn't want to turn someone's death into a financial inconvenience for him. So, after the girl's death, the parents came and took her belongings out of the room and it just remained empty since then. I actually never looked in there because it just remained locked and I don't really have much curiosity to see the room. It's on the second floor and I never go up there so I never paid any attention to it. The first weekend I spent there was pretty uneventful. I remember that I spent one night at a boyfriend's place and then the next night he slept over after we went out drinking at one of the college bars near the place. We were pretty wasted so we passed out as soon as we got home. The next weekend I was at home in my new room and I couldn't sleep so I decided to read a little bit. I was really enjoying the quietness of this new house since the girls weren't home at all. I come from a Latino family so this quiet and serene environment was pretty rare. I thought that I heard a few noises upstairs so I figured that one of the girls had probably decided to stay the weekend at the house or she was just getting last minute things ready before heading home. I didn't think much of this thing. I wasn't very close with the roommates so I didn't even bother asking them if any of them had stayed home. I just felt like it was none of my business. The girl in the basement was for sure gone for the weekend because she apparently sleeps with her door locked and keeps it open when she's not home. One weekend, that same month, I woke up to pee and I could hear a toilet flushing upstairs, which was kind of weird since I knew that none of the girls were home. I was going to go check it out but in my tired state I was too lazy and just didn't care enough. It's funny. Horror movies are supposed to make you paranoid, but the biggest lesson I got from them was that there's always a rational explanation for things. This would prove to be my biggest mistake because for a couple of months, I was always brushing things off and ironically creating irrational explanations to rationalize what I thought were irrational thoughts. For example, I heard creaking coming from the second floor and figured one of the girls must have forgotten something and decided to come by to pick it up. The girl must have driven two hours down and two hours back to her town in the middle of the night to pick something up. One Saturday I woke up to get some water and I noticed that the roommate in the basement was gone. Her door was open and her car was not in the driveway. There weren't any cars in the driveway but I should mention that one of the girls doesn't drive. A couple of hours later I woke up because I heard steps coming down into the basement. At this point I yelled out the girl's name who doesn't drive because she is the only one who could have been in the house. I didn't get a reply and just heard the steps going back upstairs. At this point, I started getting uneasy about being home on weekends, so I decided just to spend them at my boyfriend's house. One of the girls made a house Facebook page, which was supposed to address any issues like washing dishes or leaving messes, but it remained pretty inactive since everyone seemed to get along. I posted on there that some creepy stuff was happening on weekends, and asked them if they could start letting me know if they'd be home for the night or not. They seriously thought I was joking around. The replies were not receptive at all and consisted of laugh out louds and oh my god you're so funny. Even my boyfriend agreed that I was being paranoid because he too believed that everything had a rational and perfect explanation. The thing is, when you say that everything has an explanation you are only invalidating paranormal explanations or ghostly activity which is not what I was implying at all. I have never believed in ghosts or spirits or any of that jazz and I never claimed to when I spoke to my roommates or to my boyfriend. They kept saying that the house was old and made noises, but I know the difference between old house noises and someone walking down the stairs and back up the stairs. Fortunately, my roommates did start posting things on the Facebook page to let me know they'd be gone. It was always to the effect of, Hey, I won't be home this weekend so don't worry about the ghosts. One weekend they let me know that they would not be home and my boyfriend was on the midnight shift so I had to spend the night on my own. 
My boyfriend called me on his break while I was on the phone with him. I heard noises on the main floor. I told him I was going to go check it out, and he told me to go ahead because that idiot still thought I was just being paranoid. As I said this, I heard the footsteps going back up the second floor. Once I got onto the main floor, there was nobody in the kitchen, and all the doors into the house were locked. I was extremely paranoid and didn't feel safe. My boyfriend calmed me down and convinced me that everything was okay, so I never went to the second floor and it's probably best that I stayed on the main floor. After the weekend, I told my roommates in all seriousness that I was convinced that someone had been in our house at some point that night. I told them what I heard, and all those idiots still claimed that it was the old house making noises. My boyfriend was almost permanently on midnights, so I did what I never wanted to do and started spending weekends at my parents' place. The girls still posted on the page whether or not they were leaving the house or not, and I decided that I should do the same, so I also started posting when I was and was not sleeping at the house. One Friday night, the Facebook page looks something like this. Roommate 1, not sleeping at home. Roommate 2, not sleeping at home. Roommate 3, staying home because of midterm exams. Me, I'm staying at my parents'. The next morning, I received a frantic text from one of the roommates saying that the roommate with the midterms had been attacked. Apparently, she was in her room studying and heard a noise right outside of her bedroom. When she went out to inspect it, she was greeted by a man walking out of the dead girl's room. I later found out more details about the whole thing from the roommate who was attacked. The man looked rough, greasy hair, and just a dirty face. When they made eye contact, he held up his finger to his mouth and uttered a shh while smiling. The nail on his finger was long, and his beard was apparently really scraggly and uneven, like it only grew in certain parts of his face. She screamed out of instinct even though she knew there was nobody in the house. He lunged at her as she tried to shut the door, and she wasn't beaten up too badly. He just growled and told her to shut her mouth and said something like, I'm not going to hurt you, but keep your mouth shut. He beat her, but not completely unconscious, and then when he walked out of her room, he went downstairs and walked out the front door, so he left the dead girl's room unlocked. My roommate locked herself in her room and called the police who were there immediately. What's pretty creepy about the whole thing is that when they inspected the dead girl's room, they kept asking for clarification. So nobody has lived in this room for how long? Nobody has been renting this room, right? Did the parents take everything after the girl passed away? The guy had a really sweet setup actually and had brought his own small mattress to put over the bed frame. Obviously the mattress was too small for the bed frame. He left most of his stuff because he probably didn't expect a confrontation that night. I don't think he knew she would be there that night because she never was. It probably sucked for him when I moved in because before me, that idiot had the whole house to himself two days a week. The police did ask me quite a lot of questions and were interested in hearing my statement about hearing footsteps at night. My three roommates and my friend are now convinced that maybe the girl didn't die the way they said she did, and maybe he had something to do with it. But I think the autopsy would have been able to distinguish a murder from a seizure. In their defense, the whole thing is really creepy. We're not really sure how long the guy had been living there, but it's very likely that it had been for at least a few months. The theory is that the guy had been climbing in through the window, so it's possible that he was even there at times when all of us were there. The police are really interested in talking to the landlord because they want to know how the man found out about the vacant room. The landlord is a pretty decent guy, so I don't know if there's anything going on there. I don't even feel an I told you so attitude from this whole thing. I think that I am just glad that the girl is okay because she seemed pretty shaken up. I just wish people were more willing to listen to me when I told them that I thought somebody was coming into our home. I even said it might be a squatter, which everyone laughed at. This happened very recently, so it might be a while before an update. As of now, the man had not been found by police, but the police remain optimistic about finding him, whatever that means. Amanda is my brother's girlfriend. At the time of the story, she was looking for her first apartment and moving out from her parents' house. Her and my brother didn't want to move in together since they had only dated for a few months. She instead opted to search for a roommate online. Browsing Craigslist, she found an ad titled something like, Roommate Wanted, Females Only. 
This sort of thing was common since the area she was looking in was mostly young professionals. The listing was for a room in a house for about $225 a month, which was quite cheap compared to most places listed. The occupant listed herself as a 23-year-old student that wasn't quite comfortable living with any males. The other roommate wouldn't have their own room and attached bathroom. So far, Amanda was into this place. However, the listing only had a single photo from outside the property. Amanda sent an email wanting to meet the occupant and tour the house. Within 30 minutes, she receives an email back with all the details and a time to stop by. The girl worked late hours and wanted Amanda to stop by at 8 p.m., when Amanda arrives, there is a handwritten note on the front door saying, Door broken, use back door. Walking around the house, it looks nice but slightly unkempt. Tall grass, weeds, dusty windows, etc. Still, no alarms for Amanda though. When she knocks on the back door, an older man opens the door. At first, Amanda thinks she has the wrong house, but the man reassures her and says that the occupant, I forget the name, was out and he was the landlord. The occupant asked him to meet Amanda since she was working late. He seemed pleasant and offered to show her around. Alarms started going off, but aren't at red alert yet. First, the guy was clearly in his 40s, unshaven and looked like he lived in his car. Also, only the kitchen light was on. As they walked around the house, Amanda noticed one huge red flag. No furniture, nothing. The landlord was polite about answering questions but seemed irritable to keeping lights on for too long, rushing her around and only letting her look at rooms for a few moments. There was a single room that the landlord wouldn't open, telling her that it was the occupant's room and he didn't want to invade her privacy. As they walked down the hallway into the living room, she notices the front door has a plank nailed across it. Broken, for sure. Amanda's creepometer is starting to ding, so she decides to wrap up the walkthrough and leave, but trying to be polite. As she's giving the guy her thanks for the showing bit, he perks up and states that he forgot to show her the basement. It's recently furnished and would be a great rec room, and she should take a look down there. At the time, Amanda and the landlord are standing in the small hallway between the living room and the back kitchen. In this little hallway was the basement door. When he opens the door, it opens outward to create something of a barrier between Amanda and the back door. The basement is pitch black. He smiles, motions downstairs, and says, Ladies first. What happens next is nothing more than a stroke of luck. Amanda got a text just as some random person parks in the front of the house. Thinking on her feet, she pretends it's a phone call and answers her phone. Hey, yeah, are you here? I'll come out from around back and let you in. It's great, you have to see it. With a motion of confidence, she excuses herself around the landlord and walks out of the back door. She says the guy just looked at her like he was confused. Once outside, she sprinted to her car and sped out of there. When Amanda got home, she told her mother and my brother everything. Cops were called, they took her statement and went to investigate. The Craigslist post had been removed. Now... The house had been foreclosed over six months earlier and the property had been abandoned. When the police investigated, they found that the closed room the landlord didn't want her to look in was where the man had been staying. There was a pile of old dirty blankets, rotten food, and empty gallon jugs everywhere. More creepy was he had plastered ripped up pages from adult magazines on all the walls in the room. Where do you even get those anymore? The real scary part was the basement. The man had tied a thin piece of fishing twine about shin level across the stairs about halfway down. The basement was empty except another pile of old blankets, a broom handle wrapped in leather belts, and a small box with a few rolls of assorted tape, duck, electric, etc. Amanda ended up not moving in. When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. It was in a really nice two-bedroom apartment. It was cheap rent and close to campus, so it was the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29, and her name was Beth. She was tall and wide, and she had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet. But she seemed to like me and agree to let me move in. So far, so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza and that's when I could tell that something was a little bit off with her. 
Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf. I didn't know what to say, so I just shrugged it off with, thanks. I mean, I looked nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got home, she asked if I had seen her room yet. I said no, so she took me to see it. Her walls were covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She even had printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I didn't know what to make of it. It was creepy. The whole night she had been saying I look like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed, and I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend any time together, really. She would come home from work and practically run to her room. She would spend the whole night in there. She had this creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. I wondered what she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out and talk for like two minutes, and she would always be slurring her words, so I suspected she was drinking a lot. Sometimes she wouldn't say anything and she would just stand in the hallway and watch me in the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised to say, Hello Beth, and then there would be this long, awkward pause and she would give out her creepy high-pitched giggle. It was uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night I woke up at around 2am because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom and all the lights were off but I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it, and she was turning the lock back and forth over and over again. And every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Max. 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 Seeing her standing in the dark and mumbling my name really freaked me out, and it doesn't help that she kind of looks like a bigger version of the girl from the ring. I just quietly went back to my room and tried to sleep. One night I was watching Gladiator and she stumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was annoying. She then asked me if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said sure and then awkwardly sat back to listen to her. Ten minutes into her story and she was so riled up. She was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops and she wasn't listening to me when I was asking her to lower the volume. Amidst all of her screaming, one thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and yelled, I'll slit his throat. That was a big game changer. Suddenly I had no idea what this girl was capable of. She was practically a stranger and everything I had seen was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes she told me thanks for listening and she started doing her giggle. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a pretty unsettled feeling about being in the house with her, and what's worse is that there was no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as a little barricade. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was pushing the door open. I turned on my light, shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. I pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room, but I couldn't fall back asleep. The next morning when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arms. All I could think about was her saying she would slit that guy's throat. I confronted her about it and she said she didn't remember trying to push my door open. She said she didn't even remember telling me about her ex. I had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and moved out. About a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned on my phone and to my shock, I received over 40 plus text messages that she had sent me over the past two hours. They were all just insane texts that ranged from everything between Hi, how are you? to I hate you. It was insane. I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wondered if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door, would she have quietly come into my room and slit my throat? So a few years ago I was studying on a university in a major city. Normally I am living in a small town more than 70 kilometers from it, so as you might have imagined, I had to rent a room. I found one in a four-story building. Most of it was rented by various students. 
The flat I was supposed to live in looked like behind the door there was a 5-6 to six meter long corridor, very narrow one. On the right there were two doors. Behind the first one there was a room where my roommate was supposed to live in, then a kitchen practically combined with a bathroom which wasn't really hygiene positive but it's an old building. On the end of the corridor there was a big room that I was going to be living in. For a year or so it was really great. My roommate was a female student that was rather nice. She even cooked things occasionally, which was a life-saving thing considering the fact that if I were to do this, I would probably burn water black. But then she got pregnant with her boyfriend and had to say goodbye to studying. Here enters my second roommate. In fact, even after living with him for nearly half a year and all that happened then, I didn't even remember his name, really. That should tell you all you need to know about our relationship. He was a 20 to 22 year old student whose face I don't even remember either. I saw him maybe twice for he was working and studying when I was in the flat and vice versa. So time passes and we are ignoring each other. Everything is rather fine. Then things start to happen. The first warning was a call from landlord. He is a tad bit ugly old man, especially his teeth look terrible, either missing or dark yellow, but I can't say anything wrong about him as he's a decent landlord. Once I accidentally paid him too much and he quickly returned the surplus, so yeah, he was an honest guy. He had several flats in the city that he was renting to the students. He said to me that he would like me to watch over my roommate to see if something is wrong with him. Something happened in his workplace. I think he hit someone and he was talking gibberish about that when he met with the landlord about money. We paid him not through a bank account, but hand to hand. He visited us once a month for that. So later that day I returned to the flat. And what did I see? A kitchen cupboard is broken. It looked like an elephant sat on it, and the remains were spread over practically the entirety of the room. Roommate is going in circles, looking like he was trying to clean the place. I ask him what happened, and he answers something about a party ended up wrong. So right now I should probably say why I haven't left the place straight away. I'm kind of a sheltered kid, living in a small town in a not-so-big and rather peaceful European country. I am a student and in all my life I haven't even seen any drugs. I never witnessed any crime. For me it was, well, he acts strangely but hey, maybe he has a bad day. I went to bed, or rather a mattress for I slept only on it. It wasn't easy to go to sleep because he was making noises in the kitchen. I even went there to ask him to be silent. He was so surprised by me speaking, like he literally jumped. He said something along the lines of, sure, okay and then it was a tad bit less noisy. The fact that the kitchen was still a mess, and even though he was there all the time, should be a second warning, but once again, I didn't connect the dots. I only barricaded the door just in case by pushing a table that stood next to them so that the edge of that should prevent the door from opening. Also, he had his right foot in a bucket. No idea why. I was brutally awoken around 4am by him screaming that I have to open the door right now, his voice was angry, not scared, so I doubted there was a fire or something, so I loudly refused. Then he opened them by kicking them. The table with a computer on it was pushed back from the impact. The big part of the jam broke off too. He entered my room and started screaming something incoherently that he knew what I was planning. He didn't attack me, but he just kept screaming. He also broke a ceiling lamp with my favorite cup that lied on the table next to the computer. I, on the verge of a panic attack, sent a text message to my father, who was regrettably more than 60 kilometers from me, about what was happening. He tried to call the police, but for some dumb reason in this country, they can only act if a direct witness or victim is calling them. So there was no help from them, which was completely stupid in my opinion. The next half hour was strange, to say the least. My roommate kept screaming things incoherently, I think he somehow believed that I am after his life and continued to demolish the flat. I was still on my mattress, unable to leave because he was blocking the only way out. He nearly assaulted me when he saw my gloves. It was right after winter, which, as he decided, was proof that I'm a hitman and I won't leave fingerprints if I kill him while wearing them. He was maybe half a meter from me while charging at me when he suddenly jumped back screaming that he won't let me kill him that way. This routine was replayed several times. Several times he entered my room to scream something incoherently only to leave quickly. In the end I managed to get out by persuading him, the hardest persuasion skill test in my life to be honest. 
that if I leave the house without taking the keys, then he will be safe. You can imagine how I felt moving through the corridor and unlocking the door, with him being in the kitchen behind me, which was full of knives. In the end, I, however, managed to flee, wearing only pajamas and with a phone in my hand. I took refuge in another apartment in the same building in which a relative of the landlord was living with two other persons. I knew him because once the landlord couldn't collect rent in person and asked me to give the money to him. They were even kind enough to make me some tea. I stayed there until the police came, then returned to the room. The roommate opened the door. While I was packing everything that was valuable, mainly the computer and books, he was in the kitchen. The police tried to interrogate him, but rather unsuccessfully. He wasn't really responsive, but he looked like his attack was over, his manic phase, I suppose. They left him there after telling him to go for a walk to cool his head. I, in the same time, left the flat. I waited for an hour and a safe distance from this place, and my father picked me up and we drove back to my town. A few hours later, my landlord called me after I left the flat and told me to come there. The roommate was still there, and once again he ended up having some sort of mental breakdown. The landlord called the police once again, as the fella barricaded himself on the balcony, threatening to throw things on people if he wasn't left alone. This time the police came in force and practically dragged him out of the building. Now the thing is that I don't know exactly what happened to him after that. Ever since that incident, I've heard two versions. First was some sort of instantaneous insanity, schizophrenia, a paranoid type I suppose, I mean, I learned later on that he was ripping cables from the walls as he was searching for a government-made wiretapping. The second was that he took some drugs and then mixed them with alcohol and he somehow overdid it. The police searched through the room, but unfortunately, they found nothing. After that experience, I doubt that I will ever have a roommate again. I live in a sketchy part of my city and I live alone. From time to time, I invite a few friends and classmates over. Somehow relevant. I lived in a fairly large place and money was getting tight so I figured I should get a roommate. Three months ago, Sheila moved in. A little background on Sheila. This girl is kinky as all get out. She would invite various men over a few times a week. Yesterday was when she drew the line when she invited a guy over and he went ahead and stole a guitar my friend left in my place. I was furious, but also very passive-aggressive. I went to my friend's house, and when I came back, another guy is sitting on our couch. I got more angry because Sheila never learns. I noticed this guy is a little shifty. I got a good laugh because I noticed that the guy was incredibly out of his mind. He was trying not to die almost from whatever he was huffing. Maybe that's why Sheila left him alone, so I just went to sleep. I woke up to get ready for school this morning and I saw this guy happily eating cereal on our table. I got used to this. I sat next to him to eat my oatmeal and we ate breakfast in silence. Sheila came out of her room and ate breakfast too. So we're just silently eating there for 15 minutes or something. And this guy stands up, washed his bowl and carefully placed it in a drawer. Thanks for the cereal ladies. He mumbles and then quietly went out of our apartment. I said something like, out of all the guys you invited over, at least this guy's polite. Sheila just stared at me in confusion. She said, w Wasn't that your friend? Then it dawned on me that I just shared breakfast with a guy who was so high he entered a random house. So random guy, if we do meet again, bring your own cereal. My mom separated from my stepdad in early 2013 when I was 17. He had already threatened to kick me out of his home for a multitude of reasons, anything from violating curfew to being bisexual, and really, I wasn't a bad kid. All I did was work and go to school, so I moved out with my mom and agreed to pay one-third of the rent, or about $400 a month. At the time, I made $750 an hour to get verbally abused by customers and flip burgers, and I worked around 20 to 25 hours per week. Plus, I went to school. Plus, I kind of had a social life. So usually on any given week, I was home for about two evenings and out otherwise. My mom was pretty lenient with me since I was paying rent, so my curfew was probably anywhere between 12 and 2.30. 
My mom worked full-time at a Wawa that was about 45 minutes away. She was also in school and had a boyfriend that lived a town over. She was home about as often as I was. We had a cat. It was just us. And this apartment used to be a barn. It's split into four apartments, two on both floors, and has an inaccessible attic in a basement that's incredibly creepy. It's off of a main road and a ways back down a driveway in an open field with a few other ancient buildings around it and not much else besides trees. Initially, we took comfort in this, but then it got weird, like really weird. There was a closet in her bedroom that locked from the inside and randomly it would be locked. Same with the pantry. Small things would be moved and more and more we noticed we were missing things. Things would happen by themselves. Did you smoke a bowl out of my grinder? Why and when did you eat all those Cheez-Its? How did the cat flip over the litter box? It was eerie, but it was right outside of a civil war zone, a major one, said to have hosted the bloodiest battle outside of Gettysburg. It was so dumb, but at first we thought it was a ghost, or we thought it was the other person. Obviously, it was a tense and weird time in our household. And I was getting sick of my mom smoking all the time, so before I left work one day after she had left work too, I set up a simple string trap that would snap when she opened the door. I just wanted to know for sure it was her and that we didn't have a pothead poltergeist floating around our house. An hour before my shift ends, my mom calls to tell me that she needs to cover another shift, so she'll be doing a double and did I have bus money to get home. I did, so I went home. To my surprise, the string trap had been tripped. I was again missing a pinch of my green. I was incredibly sober and beyond explainably paranoid. My chest was starting to feel tight with anxiety and I grabbed the pepper spray out of my bag. As I left the room, I heard feet shuffling above my head. My heart dropped. I might have even crapped myself. I grabbed the paraphernalia, set it somewhere safe outside, and bolted from the house and ran to the Burger King across the street where I dialed 911. After a little bit, the police showed up. I was beginning to feel like I definitely overreacted. I felt so stupid. I wanted to tell Officer Jones to go home. I changed my mind. There was nobody smoking anything in my house. But I did feel better when they told me that they would go search the house, and one of them stayed outside to wait with me while the others searched for the footsteps and I'm on the phone with my mom, who's a mixture of angry and concerned, telling her that it's probably all good and I'm sorry for scaring her. But then the door to the house swings open. I can hear a struggle, and I walk to see it better. A police officer and a husky bearded man are wrestling at the foot of my stairs, just in front of the door. The bearded guy is holding onto the doorknob with one hand. I was so shocked and afraid I had to hang up the phone. The bearded man gets away and makes a sharp left across the patio over the short wooden fence and into the field with all the trees in it. He is gone into the night. The officer disappears after him only to return and tell me that he got away. They did a thorough sweep of the house. They found his semen around the drain of the shower as well as, oh god, oh god, on our loofahs and razors. They discovered that the pantry had an attic drop-down door that was painted over that this man had chipped at to get inside long before we showed up. He had been squatting there since the summer. When people moved in, he took to hiding in the attic, pantry, or closet. He came out when we weren't home. He ate our food. The officers didn't know this part, but he also smoked our green. He probably had a bond with our cat. If he didn't actually see me with my boyfriend... He definitely heard it, and seriously, who wanks it on a razor blade? Ew, it just makes me want to die to this day when I think about it. My mom's boyfriend moved in with us shortly after, and I was home even less. To this day, I am paralyzed with fear when I hear a strange noise like the house settling. I keep mace on me always, everywhere, at all times. This guy wasn't even violent, I guess, but... Just the idea that he wanked his free willy onto my loofah makes me feel unsafe in a profound way. I saw the other signs, I acknowledged them, and I ignored them. Quick backstory. I became homeless at 16 and through some help I found a place for people between 16 to 25 which gave me a house to stay in until I could find myself a permanent place. I was put in a rough area close to the center where I would get help and so on. 
This is the first story of many stories of my roommates at Rush. This was one of my first ever roommates. The house was shared except for the bedrooms which had fireproof doors with locks on it. My room was the larger bedroom and the smaller room was where my roommate lived. First day of her moving in, our Rush house worker comes round and introduces me to Holly. Holly was a large girl who was about 20 to 24 at the time and played sweet, ah, oh, you're only 16, bless you kind of role and said she would look after me to the worker. I smiled and did it all back, but I already had the feeling that she wasn't someone I wanted to look after me at all. She just had a creepy feel like she was over the top sweet to hide something. After the little intro, we didn't speak a lot when I was downstairs. She stayed upstairs and when I went to my room, she went downstairs. It didn't bother me since Friday to Sunday she was out getting wasted so I had the house to myself. Anyway, one day I sat downstairs watching a bit of Jezekiel to make myself feel a bit better about the situation I was in and I hear her stomping downstairs. She opens the door and tries to make some small talk. You know, where are you from, why did you leave, blah blah blah. After about 10 minutes of her talking about ex-boyfriends and intimate crap I didn't care for, she comes out with, are you a virgin? I stared at her for a good 5 seconds and reply, that's a pretty messed up question to ask a 16 year old. She laughs it off. We're both girls, what does it matter? I get up and reply, I'm not really into girly chats, do you mind? She stands out of the way so I can nope it back to my room thinking thank the lord it's Friday. Fast forward to about 1am where I sat in bed reading a magazine when the front door bangs followed by, Oh, shh, come, in, come in the living room. At this point, I'm just thinking, for God's sakes, there goes my Saturday morning of chilling in the house when suddenly they are talking hushed and fast. I stay quiet on the bed listening when a man's voice replies to the whisper. I'm not paying $300 if you don't know it's 150 if it's a no. His foreign accent sounds angry to say the least, but Holly becomes equally irritated too. I asked, but... She she didn't say yes or no, which probably means yes, she only just turned 16. A second man chimes in with the same accent but a more serious tone. So she is 16. I hear Holly stand up. Yes, now give me $300 or screw off. No skin off my nose, there's, there's others out there. As soon as she said 16, I knew that they were talking about me. My heart hit the floor and I sat frozen on my bed praying I locked my bedroom door. I heard her heavy footsteps slowly come up the stairs. Every step up I felt a cold chill. Hey, you awake? She slurred. She did do a pretty good impression of being wrecked, but I still stayed silent hoping she thought I'd be gone. Hello? The handle wobbled, but like an idiot my door wasn't locked and it came open. I don't think I've ever thrown myself out of bed so fast in my life. I slammed that door hard enough she fell back into the hall. I thanked Rush for making my side of the door have a twist lock and laid myself flat against the door. She played it off cool. Oh, oh sorry, didn't mean to scare you, just was checking on you. Now my teen angst got the better of me so I said as confident as I could, Go away and take whoever you're with away too. By this point she realized I knew something was going down and she started banging her fist on my door screaming and shouting to open up. She started almost begging when the two guys came charging up the stairs. The second man took on the most soothing tone he could. Hey, hey, we just want to talk about some things, that's all Holly. Holly's really upset, we need your help. Screw off or I'll call the police, is all I could muster back. With what phone? Holly laughed, scoffing, and the guys let out a quick laugh too. One of them leaned against the door on the other side and without wavering stated, If you open the door, it'll be better than if you don't, and we have to kick it down. I didn't have a witty comeback or even the strength to say no. I was 16, if they got in, I didn't stand a chance. Both the guys set off in what I guess was their native tongue. A minute passed of this until I was caught off guard by blow after blow on my door. I backed away and my door makes a noise which says it can't take two guys kicking it. 
I scan around the room frantically. My brain starts a mantra sort of, oh crap, oh crap, as I dash to the other side of the room looking for my window's keys. I grab them from my jeans, fumble with the window, and scream like I've never screamed before. They stop banging and realize I wasn't worth jail time, I guess, and me screaming like that is going to have everyone opening their front doors to nosy as to what's happening. I hear the stampede down the steps and back doors swing open then slam shut. I stop screaming and slid down the wall into a little ball. I have no idea how long I was sat there thinking, what if I, and what if they, and I didn't stop what ifing until the sun came up. I ran downstairs, chained and bolted the back door in front, then hid away for a week. Holly and the other two men never came back. She didn't leave anything behind except clothes, and I didn't tell Rush House what happened until they came around on a house check and saw the state of my door. By then it had been a month, and now I'm older and I wonder what they have been doing since. Long story short, the only reason my new roommate wanted to know so much about me and be friendly was so she could sell me to two blokes. I'm a girl who has been living with two guys off my university's campus and apartment. I'm going to my third year in college for the past year. I go to a college that's out of my home state so I had to stay off of campus because I can't afford to keep moving my stuff back and forth between my house and college dorms. I met these two guys last year through a friend of mine when I was looking for somewhere to live for the summer in the upcoming year. I was a little apprehensive about living with two guys but my friend vouched for them really hard and rent was really cheap with them so I figured why not and I decided to live with them. It was real nice living with them actually. They were nice guys and I think they liked having me around too. I kept things pretty clean and tidy. There wasn't any awkward advances for anything and I never felt harassed which was really the only worry I had. So fast forward a year and we decide that we're going to stick together as roommates but at a different apartment. One of the guys, Alex, was going to be out of town during our planned move out time so we decided a couple of days ago for all three of us to move out his room and some stuff in the living room etc just get a jump start on moving things into a public storage area until we got to the new place. So that day, we're moving things around, packing things, putting junk into boxes, etc. At one point, while the guys were moving the real heavy stuff, I was organizing Alex's dresser, taking the drawers out and putting them aside so we could carry the frame easier. I was taking one of the drawers, his underwear, socks, belts one, when something catches my eye. It's a bra. Not just a bra, my bra. I recognized it immediately because it's not just a Monday going to class bra, but an expensive one that was one of my favorites and I thought I had lost it a long time ago. I didn't think too much of that, I just figured that I had left it in the dryer or it got mixed into his laundry. No big deal. But out of curiosity I sifted around the drawer and under my bra were two panties, yes, both mine. A slow chill comes over me but I decide to give him the benefit of the doubt that he found all these mixed into his laundry and it was too awkward for him to return them to me. I get that. I shake it off, convince myself that was the case and continue to move his stuff. I find another pair of panties in another shelf but I don't recognize that one which again gives me the creeps. Now I'm curious and even though I felt guilty about it, I had to just look through his clothes. I close his door and start looking for more. I wish I didn't. I went back to the first drawers I pulled out and I find yet another one of my panties, but underneath it were a couple of pieces of photo paper with me on it. My heart seriously stopped when I saw it. They were several small 4x6 photo cards, all of me, all pictures I figured he had taken from my Facebook and I would have given him some shred of doubt if it weren't for the fact that they were all either bikini pictures or some other sexy photo, Halloween, cleavage related. I quickly put the pictures and the pair of underwear back and covered it with his stuff. At this point, I had no idea what to do. I'm so confused and scared and really just, I don't even know. I take out the rest of the drawers and put it with the others. As casually as I can, I call Alex over and ask about the first bra I found. 
The really obvious one is his underwear drawer. He turns bright red and stammers something about laundry, as I figured, and asks if I've found any more. My heart is thumping and I shake my head no. I smile and thank him for finding my bra. He says he'll finish up with his room and practically kicks me out, which just really seals up my convictions. I don't really know what to do about this. Honestly, it's been a few days since, and now that I've kind of calmed down, I'm less certain about not rooming with them next year. I don't want to go through the paperwork with canceling the lease and stuff. And really, he's such a nice guy otherwise that I'm not even sure this is an argument worth having. But to all creepy roommates, yuck. This happened just about two weeks ago. I live in a two-bedroom apartment with my longtime friend Mark. We've been friends since we were in diapers, and now we're both 22-year-old college students. We're regular guys. I play video games, hoot and holler at the women, and I just consider myself a regular dude. Mark is the same, except that he's gay, but that is so completely irrelevant to who he is as a person. Before I start the story, I just want to say that I am not homophobic, which is what homophobic people usually say, but I have a sister that's a lesbian and a younger brother that's bisexual. My poor parents, one lesbian, one straight, and the other bi. Mark was raised like my brother, so there's another gay. Anyway, on to the story. Last month, around November 3rd, if I recall, Mark brought home this guy. He was really handsome, was clean-shaven, was wearing the remnants of a business suit. He was our age, 25, Mark said. His name was Chad, and he was Mark's new love interest. I greeted Chad and welcomed him into our humble abode. Chad was great. He played Halo with me, we talked about cars. He offered to let me borrow some of his COD games when he was over the next time. Hell, even I was developing a crush on this guy. This went on for about two weeks. Chad would come over, Mark would cook him dinner, and then Chad would hang out with me. I was growing to like him. One night, I decided to turn in early because I had an exam the next morning. Chad and Mark stayed up to watch a movie, but I heard them go into Mark's bedroom, but I fell asleep soon after. It was probably like three hours later when I was awoken by the sound of my door clicking shut. Normally, I'm a very heavy sleeper, able to sleep through very loud 5am construction with my windows open, but this woke me up. Groggy and slightly agitated, I squinted to see what made the sound. I could barely make out Chad. He wasn't wearing a shirt, and he was staring right at me. Wide eyes, a look of fear on his face. I felt a chill run down my spine, and I was on alert. What are you doing, Chad? I sat up, turning on my light. Chad ironed his face into a normal look. I, I thought I heard you call my name. He said in a whisper, as if he didn't want anyone to hear. He was acting really weird and I felt very creeped out. We stared at each other awkwardly for about 10 to 15 seconds, then he apologized and left. The next morning, Chad acted as if everything was normal. I didn't sleep much after he left. I told Mark about what happened and he didn't seem concerned. He just said that Chad was probably sleepwalking or dreaming. I wasn't convinced, but I soon forgot about it. Full-time student with a full-time job... I don't have time to dwell on personal dramas. Two nights later, Chad was back over again. I was sick with a cold, so I took some NyQuil and went to bed after a few games of Assassin's Creed with Chad. It was 5.36am when I heard my door close, because I remember my eyes popping open and looking right at my alarm clock. But, before I could process what was going on, I felt a hand clamp across my mouth, and another deliver a hard blow against my Adam's apple. I started choking. It was Chad. He was on top of me and I was struggling to get him off. I threw him against the wall which only subdued him for a second. I rolled onto the floor but I couldn't speak because of my gagging from the hit to my throat. Chad pulled me down, wrestled me into submission and began pulling on my boxer briefs. He kept shushing me, telling me that it would be over soon and that he knew I was curious. I was frantic and I was slow because of the NyQuil I had consumed, but I managed to roll over just as Chad took off his pants, and I kicked him off of me. I was able to hit him in the balls, which made him shout out in pain. Then Mark burst inside, saw Chad with his pants down and me trying to catch my breath. 
The look on Mark's face is one that I'll never forget, heartbroken and angered and confused all at once. Chad stood up, said I tried to beat him, etc., but Mark went insane and almost beat the crap out of him. I pulled him off and Mark gave Chad an ultimatum. Either he calls the cops or he gets out and never comes back. Chad left immediately, but Mark still called the cops and told them what happened. They came by, took our statements, and we got a call two days later that Chad was in custody and he confessed. Mark also let out a small detail. Chad snorted certain powders, which apparently were in his system when he was picked up. But Mark is recovering, and he still feels guilty, I think, for having it happened. He keeps apologizing every time I see him, but I don't know. Things like this happens. I'm just glad that my best friend Mark wasn't hurt by him. Hey friends, thanks for listening. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community. Be sure to check out my Choose Your Own Path horror game on the iOS and Android app store, and grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.